Welcome to Business Line's State of the Economy podcast, where you will find insight, analysis, and the story behind the numbers. Welcome to the State of the Economy podcast, where we delve into the critical issues shaping the digital landscape today. In this episode, we are tackling a topic that is increasingly vital for organizations of all sizes. that is internal cyber security threats and how to combat them cyber security is not just about defending against external hackers many threats come from within an organization these internal threats can be just as damaging if not more so due to the access and acknowledge that insiders possesses today we will explore the various facets of internal cyber security challenges and provide insights on how organizations can protect themselves we will start by discussing the key cyber security challenges that organizations face internally which can disrupt smooth functioning we have seen recently how an update in cyber security software at microsoft brought the businesses across the world on their knees we have with us today mr sundar balasubramanian managing director of checkpoint software technologies for india and sar to help us understand these challenges welcome to the podcast mr sundar thank you dr kurmanath it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me for this discussion here today before i get started i think that's a good topic that you brought up in terms of what are the challenges that are being faced by the indian enterprise today with respect to cyber security right so it's a multi vector problem uh, cyber security definitely uh, i'm proud of way uh, the overall indian uh, market posture has been during covid and after that uh, so we have been pretty uh, resilient and strong right and we have also uh, made sure that as a country and as a, a collection of enterprises we could withstand uh threat vectors both externally and internally but in today's topic specifically talking about what are the internal challenges of an indian enterprise i would like to start uh, by a favorite passionate topic of mine which is the shortage of cyber security resources in the country today as we speak as a country uh, if you look at cyber security skills across oems partners customers we are at this point in time not more than 70% of uh, people that we actually need so if if you look at some of the statistics as we speak there is a need for about 40000 certified cyber security professionals in the country so that's concern number 1 and uh, that's something which is again passionate to check point passionate to me so we are doing a little bit to basically uh, mitigate the problem we have something called the secure academy where we take these courses right talk to the colleges so that the, the kids start uh, understanding the importance of cyber security and cyber security as a profession we also uh, facilitate a lot of colleges who are serious about cyber security by basically giving them a, a significant allowance and supporting them from building out a cyber security curriculum within the campus so i think the f- challenge number one is we need to mitigate the challenge of the shortage of cyber security professionals in the market and really make sure that this career is seen as a career which is uh, something which is long term for people coming out of colleges so that's uh, i think challenge number one. challenge number 2 i think is more to do with the internal threats i mean today as we speak uh, we assume all the threats come from outside it's which is actually a fallacy right uh, a majority of this threat comes from the inside what we call as insider threats this could be both intended threats as well as unintended threats where people we could be employees contractors or even business partners who intentionally and accidentally or accidentally misuse the legitimate access and thereby giving access to cyber criminals so many of these data breaches attributed to internal uh, threats could be both malicious as well as uh, inadvertent actions of employees without understanding what they're doing right so uh in 2023 alone 71% of uh, indian enterprises uh, experience any way between 21 to 40 uh, inside a threat security accident so that's like 67% uh, more than 2022 so again uh, just to put it in the pecking order first is a shortage of uh, security security skills in the country second is the insider threat syndrome that we are coming through 
The third thing as a direct derivative of the internal threats, the employee awareness. So today people get uh, threats to multiple vectors. It could be on a mobile phone, it could come through as email, even as we speak on a collaboration tool, I could send you a link which could potentially be malicious, right? And it could come through multiple vectors. Uh, and today we are graduated from phishing to quishing. I could just send you a QR code and the Indian culture, thanks to digital payment, right? We we don't suspect whether the QR code is actually malicious or not. We tend to open the scanner and scan the code. The moment you scan the code, like it's the you're compromised. So the the, the virus already inside your phone, right? So employee awareness is the third thing that we need to look at, which is basically educating the employees on what to do, what not to do. Given that cybersecurity is a board level conversation right now, it's basically increasing the awareness at, as a whole. The fourth point which has come and <clears throat> got accelerated during COVID is this migration towards cloud. Now people have migrated a lot of workloads to the cloud and even some of the mature enterprises are confused between uh, enterprise security off the cloud and enterprise security within the cloud. So they assume that the major cloud players provide you security. So you don't need to worry about anything which happens inside the cloud, which is a bet. What the platform uh, cloud providers provide is platform level security, which is basically security off the cloud. But actually, uh, within the cloud, it's as much as a real life data center with a lot of moving traffic, especially east west traffic which can be potentially compromised. So the, the, the added complication with cloud security and the lack of understanding of cloud security has also accelerated some of the internal threats of uh, enterprise. Sunda. Uh, sure, good. I'm sorry. Sure, good. Yeah. Yes. Th thanks for uh, the broad overview yeah. of the challenges uh, no, uh, that organizations face. I if I can uh, broadly uh, segregate all these challenges, one is uh, the naive uh, things that employees do uh, by clicking uh, the external uh, no, links and all. That is one thing, naive things. And no, uh, putting uh, pen drives and all that uh, without knowing that what kind of uh, malicious software they may be carrying. Uh, that is one thing. Second thing is deliberate attempts uh, that no, some black sheep uh, uh, they do. That is the second uh, thing I uh, see a major challenge. And the third challenge is uh, the patches, uh, the updates, you know, like the one uh, happens with uh, the uh, no, no Microsoft recently. So I see these three are the major challenges as far as a layman's perspective. Can you just uh, give me? You explained how a you know by clicking a link uh, you are inviting trouble. Uh, can you just tell us uh, what are the unintended? Uh, uh, problems uh, by you know uh, because of uh, naiveness or uh, lack of awareness, how employees can you know bring in a malicious software into the organizations, and then we can uh, discuss uh, the patches, uh, what kind of uh, uh, you no know, measures uh, we should uh, take when we go for uh, an update. So that's a great question, Doctor. And uh, I think there are multiple threat vectors that employee today faces. Uh, he or she accesses company data through the mobile phone. He or she accesses the company data through laptop, through applications. Now, the latest uh, threat vector, which has got very significant, it's around email and collaboration. So everybody uses email and collaboration. So I can send you a mail with a with an attachment, which has a malicious file in it. Or I can send you a uh, mail with a <clears throat> legitimate file with a malicious uh, link embedded there. Or I can use a collaboration tool. I can use any other collaboration tool to send you. Even this in this collaboration tool that we are in, right? I can send you a link that you can't uh, distinguish whether it's legitimate or not. So there are multiple threat vectors. So generally, uh, what we advise uh, users in enterprise to do is want to be vigilant, right? When, uh, whenever you are getting something, and I, I just quote a very very briefly, I'll quote a real life example where a big IT services company. Right, employees of the company got a mail impersonating HR. Right, the mail looked like it came from the HR department, collecting very vital personal data. Right, and which before the company could realize was actually coming from an external attacker. So the external attacker landed up collecting a whole vast <laughs> range of data from the employees, which are sensitive and private. Right, so. The only way we can counter this is to basically educate the employees. So whatever comes in through anything which looks innocent, through a mail, through, a, through even a WhatsApp, through any of the application level messaging, 
any of the collaboration level messaging. Okay, we have to exercise extreme vigilance on that, point number one. Point number two is that I think we also advocate the need for strong endpoint production products. Okay, so I don't got to advocate what Checkpoint does, but then I think we are also the business to provide security where we can actually track anything, can scan the mail, we can scan the attachment, we can scan the links within the attachment and eradicate those uh, links before they actually reach the user. So uh, we have a different philosophy. We believe in prevention. We believe that if it's detection, then we are already too late. The uninvited guest has come into the network. So we believe in prevention, but uh, we need to really, we advocate one is education to use of strong tools, right, which can potentially uh, prevent any of this malicious uh, intrusion. The third thing we also need to be mindful of is uh, identity in person impersonification, which is basically uh, right now, right from deep fake videos to voice to identity personification, right? Multiple uh, threat vectors are being used to attack uh, people who are of uh, either high position or or uh, value of money, right? And those uh, kind of things is something which we also, only way we can solve this education. So uh, I personally have been impersonified multiple times, right? I mean, uh, the level of sophistication of attacks, that they're attacking somebody in the cybersecurity industry means that you can imagine how vulnerable a normal person who's not aware of this, who doesn't do this for a living, can be potentially exploited. So these are some of the things that we have seen and the ways we can prevent, again, Security is a always evolving field. The, the better we get on the good side, the more experience the bad side gets. So it's always a race against time. See, what are the learnings for organizations at the end point? And what are the lessons that cybersecurity companies like you? And what are the learnings for the actual you know, uh, ISVs, like uh, our platform owners like uh, Microsoft? in the whole episode that the world witnessed last year. What are the key lessons for each of these three uh, uh, ecosystem players? So I, I can really comment about Checkpoint. I can tell you that we are 31 years in this uh, business. So mm-hmm. security is not just about uh, brilliance. It's also about experience and wisdom. So we uh, manage this through what we call a threat cloud. Uh, we have four times the traffic that we inspect, number of devices we inspect compared to Google. So if uh, Google is $2.2 billion, we, we have 8.8 uh, <clears throat> devices we inspect on a daily basis. So I think from a checkpoint standpoint, we believe in three things. We pre- believe that it's prevention. So we should not get to the stage where we detect that if it gets too late. Second thing we are immensely proud about is our learning in the past, as well as uh, before the world started waking up to artificial intelligence, we were doing AI in our threat cloud as early as 2014. Right, so we do run, run AI threat engines in our threat cloud, 50 of them, right? So that any threat which is known or unknown, right, is picked up and then we once we confirm that's a confirmed threat, we push it across to millions and billions of devices across the world that we manage. So one is obviously the, the, the extent of uh, experience that we have in the industry as well as the, the knowledge of the incidents in terms of all the forms of vectors of attack that we do is one form of uh, difference in my view, right? The second part is to strengthen the processes. I mean, which is all, often we see that while we uh, do our best to release the, the products, which are, and I've been here for five years and I can tell you we have not, never been breached. And I'm very proud of that in India. So uh, when we actually uh, release products, we put it through a lot of quality assurance. We make sure that everything is tested before we, we release that into the market because Security, again, can be a boon or a pain. And uh, the way we look at security is our job is to prevent uh, attacks on our customers who use Checkpoint. So we do a lot of uh, testing, but then, again, going down to the ground with respect to releasing any kind of uh, hot fix that we do, we also make sure that for our key strategic enterprise customers, we are directly supervising that so that like there is no process or manual error that happens. While artificial intelligence is going to play a significant role around security ops as we move forward. Till as of now, today we speak, uh, there is a dependency on a manual intervention for people to go out and deploy whatever fixes that the security better comes out. So between the combination of both of this and it's very, very strong education of the market, 
right? Both as partners and customers, I think so far we have been extremely successful in making sure our customers are protected and secure. Businesses, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, as endpoint users, what could be the learnings for businesses in facing, uh, you know, these kind of, uh, tackling these kind of disruptions? See, endpoint is uh, user experience based in the company. So company pays as much so, importance see, my to... Business, yeah. My business is disrupted because some platform is facing an issue with an update. Like it happened with the Microsoft case last year, most of the uh, businesses which were using Microsoft platform, uh, their businesses have been impacted. So as a business, if I am a business, what kind of uh, precautions that I should take to avoid uh, those kind of situations? So three things on that. One is obviously I need to look at my overall security architecture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we advocate zero trust. Right. And wherever a checkpoint customers come back to us, we do everything end to end from a security posture analysis to the network analysis to the architecture. OK, we look at that. So I think it's very important to have a very strong security posture from a customer standpoint. That is a broader uh, uh, I would say recommendation that we make from checkpoint to our customers. Second thing is that we also need to examine the the points of failure, right? And we need to really be clear about uh, are we de-risking the points of failure? Because in security, uh, failures do happen. I mean, failures is something nobody can. I mean, nobody can predict that you're going to have a zero percent failure kind of a scenario. But having said that, what is the kind of uh, failure uh, points in the security architecture that we need to really evaluate at? The third most critical thing is what we call the IRT service room checkpoint. Okay, it's an incident response team. Okay, uh, in simplistic language, it's like the ambulance service of a specialty hospital, right? Uh, so it's like basically somebody <laughs> goes in, goes into the first aid, and basically at least puts the threat at bay and then starts investigation. So we offer that as a service. So this is not tied only to checkpoint uh, products and uh, solutions. It's also we offer IIT as a heterogeneous service for the customers, and we have been engaged. So it's very important whether you go to Checkpoint IIT or some other IIT, it doesn't matter. But whenever you are in a crisis, it's very important to really invoke the IIT service from a, a known uh, reputed security vendor, right? So what happens with that is that instead of somebody uh, internally trying to fix the problem with without really having potentially the proper skills, right? You have somebody who's expert in that who comes in and at least tries to isolate the problem, identify the problem, and then remediate the problem. So isolation is the number one, right? We need to isolate the problem and then remediate it, right? So these are the three things we would ideally recommend, right? Um, in colossal failures, obviously, uh, I mean, that's a completely different topic by itself, but then uh, I think in any normal uh, security incident that happens or compromise that happens, this is what we advocate from China. Okay. Okay. See, Sundar, I have uh, spoken to several cybersecurity experts, uh, experts like you last month on this issue. So actually, it boils uh, down to two, three issues. What they were suggesting is, uh, one is uh, you should be sandboxing an update before you actually launch on a platform. That is one thing they said. The second thing is you do it in parts. You launch the update in a particular wing or a you know, manageable thing. And then seeing the results, you actually scale it up. What is your view on this? Absolutely well said, uh, Dr. Rabbit. Uh, see, the, the most critical installations that we have in the country, right? Whenever we're going to update or upgrade, right? We normally recommend that we do it on a UAT uh, platform, which is a test bed platform, which is isolated from the main network. Okay. We we don't allow uh, upgrades and updates to be done in production environment. So we are leaders in banking. We are leaders in the Indian defense. We are leaders in the government, right? Uh, we also uh, have a huge install base around GSIs, but wherever we do, especially in regulated industries, we strongly recommend and uh, that it's done in an isolated test environment any update or upgrade, however small that might be, right? So that like the impact is uh, not uh, organization wide. Uh, we definitely put our foot down where checkpoint managed infrastructure. We definitely don't do any of this life. We don't do it on production environment because uh, having large stock exchanges and large banks running on infra 
and trying to do that uh, on production is uh, literally suicide. I mean, the gun can backfire. Uh, so any from our uh, point of view, the standard operating procedure for any upgrade update is to try it out in a you know test environment, preferably isolated, test it properly so that like we can simulate the traffic on the test environment and then move that gradually into the segments, not move it entirely. So every organization will have multiple security segments, right? So we recommend our customers to do uh, in a phase banner, recommend with the least critical and then and start planning out a deployment uh, to the most critical over a period of time, depending on the urgency. This could be days or this could be weeks, right? Depending on the criticality of the thing. So I'm just echoing what you said, right? Which is, I think, the best practice with respect to preventing any catastrophic uh, uh, incidents uh, that can happen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sundar Balasubramanian, uh, for your uh, insights. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doctor. Really pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Thanks. See you.